Hello everyone, welcome back. A quick disclaimer before I get into the video. There's a little blue guy running across the screen, who is rather charming and cute when it's streaming at real time, but this is now sped up 40 times, so that you, know, you can see stuff happening uh, faster, and he becomes very very annoying, so I, you're just going to have to get used to that. Also my mouth flapping away in the top corner, like that's just, it's just going to be there now. I've decided from now on that I'm not going to stream with any of these extra elements because it means that if I want to turn um, any of these videos into uh, content like this, then they just become very distracting elements on screen. Anyway, what I'm going to do is uh, skip back to the beginning so I can actually talk about what I'm doing. So this was the push to start making fruit people again. Uh, this was back when the only fruit person I'd made was the Pineapple Boy, and I really wanted to continue that series because I really enjoyed it, and I think it exemplified a really key idea that I have in character design, which is trying to be as sort of representative of a real object as possible. Um, what I'll talk about a lot is how when you're trying to make an audience engage with a design that you've created, the important part is that you are drawing from a shared experience, so an experience which they've also had with objects in their life. And of course, some people may have never tasted a dragon fruit in this example, or held one in their hand, that sort of thing, but generally there is a common understanding with elements that are at least common enough. Um, some of these fruits are actually quite bizarre, or quite um, foreign to, to me at least. And that's where it starts to become interesting, because when you get someone engaged with uh, something that they can relate to, you can then make them interested in something that they had no interest in before, so they see a like this character, for example, which is based on the uh, sweet apple, sugar apple even. Um, I wasn't really aware of that as a fruit up to this point, but you present a sugar apple inspired design next to a pineapple inspired design, they immediately understand the pineapple and then are interested in to see what actually inspired the second one. So with all of these, I'm trying to make sure that they're as representative of the, the main inspiration as possible. So. From, from the get-go, there's obvious textures that you can borrow. And as I whiz through these designs, I'm taking the one thing that to me feels like the defining feature of that fruit. So in this case, a banana, the common experience of banana is probably not even yellow necessarily. When you go to eat a banana, it's the peeling of the banana and then eating the inside. So anything that's to do with peeling and you know all of those designs, they hinged on the idea that uh, something has been peeled away and that's either becoming the armor, the clothing, uh, or whatever it was. That's, I think, the most visceral experience that people have with a banana. And so it's the thing that I want to draw on. Um, so now I'm starting to design the Jurian and uh, the equivalent for him would be the sort of abrasive and obnoxious um, smell that uh, the Jurian has. Like a lot of people really hate the smell. Some people like it, but you know they can still understand that it's it's very bold, it's always present, like you can't ignore it when it's there. So I figured that in his design, that really needs to come through, it needs to be this very big, bold, um, unapologetic sort of character. And, you know, if, if anyone, any of them was going to be sort of stereotypically evil, I figured that this would be the guy to do it. Um, so, you know, really leaning into the uh, spiky design of the Jurian. Um, so then same thing with this uh, sugar apple, it's really just in the name, like it's going to be sweet, rounded and cute and the actual shape design that I get from the reference is, is very much uh, reflected in that. And so the, the main thing that I would sort of take away from this is that feeling of this dense outer, outer layer because of its um, compound kind of hexagonal structure. It feels very much like armor to me, so I figured that if I was going to sort of the typical classes that people will understand in a design, like the the ranger, the the tank, um, the shield, uh, the shield wielder, that kind of thing, that this would be um, a character really focused on defense, and that's that's why my immediate plan going in was going to be something cute and and sweet looking because that seems to be the bit obvious uh, take from from this fruit, but then also it's going to be like a shield class, so. Shield would be a big part of the design, and then um, really emphasizing the the idea of like how they're using um, armor in their in their appearance. So the actual face being sunken away, kind of out of harm's way. Um, 
it seemed like the obvious choice. And, you know, per person, that's that's the thing that really uh, makes people's art individual is that even if they're taking the same um, inspiration, so, you know, you could get a group of artists to all design a character based on a sugar apple. And they would all come up with different, different takes on it because uh, to each artist, the thing that stands out and is most important about that um, object is going to be different. Um, so, yeah, I've done these this lineup of characters, and you can see I've actually jumped into uh, rendering the sugar apple a little bit. I decided that I really wanted to make sure that I captured the the same feeling of the original fruit. So here, to to cut corners because um, you know I was trying to get through four of these designs. Uh, I started off just with a very rough photo bash, and I think I did that for most of the others too. I liked the colors that I had in the original image, um, and I feel like personally that represented the character the most. So I could just put chunks of those colors in and then start to work over the top um, to basically remove uh, detail uh, to start making it feel more believable as, as one of these sort of very stylized designs. So I may actually start doing a similar thing with the, the horned lemon here. Um, I've taken bits which are almost one-to-one -one replicate, like uh, the representations of the, the original fruit. So in this case, it's like you could imagine you could actually construct this character if you took a, a horned melon, sliced off the top. That's basically the skirt. So there's like a one-to-one -one correlation between the real fruit and um, how I've included it in the design. And the same thing with the sugar apple. Um, it's almost like an entire sugar apple squished down the middle and then with a face in the middle. And this isn't certainly isn't the way you should design uh, characters, but these ones. I'm leaning into the simplicity and the immediate understanding that you can get from uh, literally taking taking items as they are in the real world and applying them straight to the design. So um, the original pineapple boy you see on the top right, in the center of his design you have basically a pineapple body. The, the rough around his neck is essentially the head of that pineapple and then his head himself is, is just a straight pineapple plonked in the middle with eyes carved out in the middle. So it's like supposed to be as clear as possible. And then all the things which, you know, fruit really uh, doesn't represent well, uh, the limbs and things, that's where I can start to be more creative about how I apply the different textures from the, from the reference to something which doesn't yet exist. Um, I think I actually have less of an obvious example with the, the dragon fruit I'm doing here. The spear itself is basically taking one of those big petal-like shapes on the side, um, taking that exact shape and turning it into the weapon. But the rest of his design was really focused on the, the fact that the inside of the dragon fruit has this pale, um, pale white sort of flesh color. Um, and that looked like the vulnerable bit. I mean, really, the, it's a common element with all of these is that the outer skin looks like it should be armor or clothing and the inside would sort of replace what a human would be underneath that. So the flesh of the actual um, character underneath. And so that's that's the main sort of idea that I've ex like continued between all these designs. And it gives them a consistency, which otherwise they may not have, um, seeing as you know the color palette's switching up, um, all the sort of textures on the surface are switching up each time. And really there's no sort of common element in terms of um, like a story. I haven't yet decided that they're all part of a faction or not. Like if you imagine that this was some big kind of uh, standard sort of RPG fantasy world, except everything is a fruit, then you would expect there to be uh, common factions and maybe like uniforms and things that were unified groups of them. But I had yet to get into any of that. They're almost all individuals. And because of that, there are things I need to do instead to make sure that their designs still feel unified. So yeah, going back to the photo bashing technique, um, as you can see, like when you photo bash directly in like this, there's a a really big conflict in how much detail uh, you have across the piece. Ultimately, I want the face to be the important bit, and yet the face, because it doesn't exist in the original fruit, is the only thing I'm actually going to paint in myself. 
which naturally means unless I spend a lot of time on it, it's going to be less detailed or less refined than the photograph. Because even if you look at something like the arm here, um, it doesn't necessarily have a huge number of wrinkles in. So it's not necessarily detailed, but the refinement of those shapes, um, because they read as photographic, um, they will always stand out because they capture our eye. Um, we see like the perfect range of um, highlight to shadow, uh, which makes them so easy to read. And so a big part for me when I've used uh, photographs is that I need to make sure I pull back a lot of that detail, paint over the top. So as you can see here, instead of trying to select out that area and brighten it with a uh, with levels or something to, to keep the detail underneath, I'm very happy to paint straight over the top and, and crush a lot of that stuff away. Because otherwise it's going to persist as something which ends up being a distraction from the areas I want you to look at. And the only alternative is then to try and render the entire piece photographically, which could be cool, uh, but again, this is not what I was aiming for with these with these characters. I had a couple I wanted to do, so I was really trying to make sure I balanced my time between them. But yeah, going into the rest of it, um, it was important here that I also make sure I separate out the local color. Sometimes with photographs, as you can see in the spikes on the side, uh, the shadow versus the light, there's going to be a lot of uh, color difference within that. And when you photo bash just a section of an image, then that color variation actually becomes far more prominent because instead of having the rest of the image to compare it to, we're seeing only a small chunk and we're then showing it next to much more consistent colors because naturally when you paint colors in, you choose an area, uh, you choose a color and then you fill an area with it. And so you typically end up with um, colors that have far less variation in them than they would if uh, it existed in a real space and you're taking a photo of it. So because of that, it's it's very important to make sure that whenever you put in photos, you compensate for the fact that the photo will always have much more color information. There's actually a really cool artist, um, Lu Gao, that uh, you can see it in some of his work, and I'll, I'll try and put an image here, where they've put in an image and you can see that with the hue and saturation slider, they've just recolored the entire thing. So they've taken out all of the uh, color information and completely replaced it. And they've left only the, the value structure that that image gave. And so uh, they can then put it into their, they can bash it into their image and it can feel very convincing. It almost feels more like you've used a textured brush with that just happens to have the exact right texture for that area of the image. And it could just be because we're so used to seeing the use of texture brushes, but it makes it far more believable because now instead of having all three elements of um, like ex exact lighting, um, perfect sort of color dynamics and uh, value structure that a photograph has, um, it only has one of those things. And so it feels far more uh, consistent with the rest of the image, which you would actually paint in yourself. Anyway, I've split this up into three parts because I feel like it's probably going to be a bit more palatable like that. Uh, and also just trying to deal with the original files on my computer because they were so big. Uh, I had to do it chunk by chunk. So that's it for this chunk. I'll see you in the next one.